The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem and this is my client multimeter. Don't get me wrong, it's an awesome tool and I use it all the time. But when I do breadboarding, that means trying out circuits on a breadboard, I don't need all these functions and I just want an easy way to connect it and not having to use like alligator clips and stuff. I just want it to be simple and effective. And I don't find that on the market, so let's build our own tiny multimeter. Amazing hacks. Inspired Designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. What we're building today is a tiny version of this multimeter, basically. I want it to be the size of the screen, so that's about two inches. It's also the same width as a common breadboard. And I want it to do the basic functions. Voltage, current, and what else I can implement. Let's see how far we can do this. I also want it to be open, so software-wise you could implement new functions or make it more accessible or change the user interface. Also, I want all the functions to be dialed with a knob, like on the big one, so I can just turn the knob and directly access anything, no complicated menus. And while I'm at it, why not make it Wi-Fi compatible so I can also get the readout on my phone and don't have to watch the screen. So if I can have a more suitable position for the screen, I can just use my phone. Let's see what we will need to accomplish that. First, we have to decide on a microcontroller. As I'm a casual maker, I want to be able to program it with Arduino. And I also want to have the Wi-Fi functionality built in and everything else that we need. So serial interfaces, USB, all that sort of jazz. I want it to be easy to use. And also it has to be very compact because the multimeter should be only like two inches. I'm choosing an ESP platform, not the ESP8266 because that is running out. I won't use the ESP32 because I think that's pretty much overpowered. I use the ESP32 S2, the brand new one, which is actually more of a successor to the 8266. So it's a low power microcontroller with built-in Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth this time, and it has a native USB port. So once I have set that up with a programmer to accept a native USB port, I can use that and that should make it easier. And because it's 2020, I will give it USB-C. To do the actual current measurement and voltage measuring, I need an IC. I chose the INA219 by Texas Instruments. This is connected via I2C to the controller and also via I2C I'm using an OLED, a Midas one that is compatible with the Adafruit SSD SD1306 library, I think it's called. So that should be working with known to work libraries on Arduino. I also need a charge controller for a LiPo battery and a LiPo battery, of course. And then I have to fashion that all up into a tiny package. There's no way around a very detailed, intricate PCB. Uh, thankfully, I know some guys that make them for me called Eisler. And let's start with the PCB design in KiCad. This is the PCB design. Uh, we start with the schematic, of course. First thing we have to look at is our processor. It's the ESP32-S2. That's a Vroom module, which means it's a pre-certified module with a PCB antenna on it. Of course, we need a stable voltage source. We have to tie the reset line high, so the chip is enabled. Also important that we have the flash pin at IO0. If that is high, no, if that is low while the chip is resetted, it puts it in programming mode and then we can program it over the native USB, which is located as these two pins. Of course, we need some other pins like the ADC for uh, possible resistance measuring 
and serial data and serial clock for the I2C interface. Very important. Also, we have an encoder, so we can select which mode we want to do. The I2C interface connects to an OLED, which is here. It has serial clock, serial data, power ground, four pins on a standard 2.45 millimeter header that will hold the OLED module. And also on the I2C bus is this INA219 chip, serial data, connect here. These two jumpers are used to set the address. Every I2C device needs to have a unique address so you can identify it on the line. Never use the same on two chips that will not work at all. Also, we need a current chunt for the current measuring and this is where the measurement leads will connect. Here's a voltage divider for the resistance measuring, but the ADC on the ESP32 S2 and also on the other 32 is not that great. So let's see how that will turn out. Then we have a USB port. You can tell that is a USB-C port because it has a ton of uh, connections on it. CC1 and CC2, I think, are connectors uh, that make the chips inside USB devices um, decide on which power to provide. If you tie them both to ground with 5.1K, this connector basically behaves like USB 2.0. And we can also tie the D plus and D minus lines together. So no matter in which orientation you plug in your cable, it will always work. So very neat. Then we have the voltage bus that feeds into an MCP73831. And this is a single cell LiPo or lithium ion charger. Only single cell, very important. You can set the charge current with this resistor. 2K should result in 500 milliamps. Then we have a stat indicator. Pulling that one low, meaning the LED lights up, means it's charging. If it's high, it's not charging anymore. Voltage battery feeds into the battery that is also connected to ground. And then it goes over a dip switch into a voltage regulator. MCP1825S is a 3.3 volt voltage regulator. One thing that I see now is that this circuit has no battery protection. So if you use this kind of circuit, you have to have a protected cell attached. If you have unprotected cells, then you might be able to drain the cell beyond repair. So you can kill it by running your device too long or you can overcharge it. And if you have set the thresholds or if you have selected a charger that's suitable for your cell, it, it shouldn't happen, but there's no guarantee. And if you use like a random LiPo that you have around, most certainly it will not match. So always use protected cells with that kind of circuit or do circuit protection. It's not that easy. Okay, and that is my schematic. Next step is to assign footprints and then put that into a PCB design. And that's what I did here. So this is the PCB design. I switch to the other side. You can see the main chip here. You can see the charger here. It's very compact, charging indicator light. Here's the USB-C, the encoder. Here's where the leads connect. That's the power regulation. And if you go on the other side, you can see the INA219 over here. And that is the current shunt resistor. So a current shunt resistor doesn't have only two pads, it has four. The small ones are for the measuring leads. The big ones, those are the ones that carry the current. So always use high precision, known value uh, current shunt resistors when you do measuring because quality matters in that case. Bad resistors will give you bad measurements. And if we are really fancy, we can now put that into 3D. And as you can see, I'm missing a few models. I don't have models for these parts. But you can also see this is the INA219. Pretty tiny IC is SOIC, but even tinier is the charge controller, which is a SOT23, no, SOT25 package. Also, I've learned that SOT25 and SOT26 are the same as SOT23-5 and SOT23-6. So that's just differently called by different manufacturers. Don't worry about that too much. Yeah, and that's it. 
let's send this board over to Isla and get it manufactured. And then it's time for the assembly. The assembly of my tiny multimeter was pretty challenging because it has a lot of very tiny parts and it's not so easy to do uh, soldering in these tiny spaces. I used a hot air station for that and not my crappy reflow oven because that is pretty unreliable and not, it's not very good at surface mount stuff that doesn't like to be overheated. But in the end I got it to work. I had some solder bridges and needed to rework it several times until I got the I2C connections for all devices right. So be aware of solder bridges, they sometimes hide under the parts. Then I mounted it into this 3D printed case made of PTG and a clear case lid made from acrylic. And now it's time to code. Hello, I'm James from Workbench Wednesdays, a show about the stuff found on your electronics workbench. Look for new episodes on, well, Wednesdays. You can connect with me over on the Element 14 community. I look forward to seeing you. For now, it is time to get back to watching this week's project video. Okay, it's time to look at the code. First, we have to include a ton of libraries. We need the Adafruit SSD 1306 library, that's for the OLED. We also need Wi-Fi and Web Server for Wi-Fi, of course. And Adafruit also has a library for the INA219. So very handy if you want to build something that needs a specialized chip. I try to search first for a library that I can use and then a chip that supports it. So. We have some credentials that are none of your business, but you can also use uh, this variant here, which makes it into an access point. Importantly, we have to start a web server and also we need to declare the pins for serial data and serial clock for the I2C terminal. And uh, we have to define that because you can basically put pretty much any pin on the ESP32-S2 into an I2C device, so the program has to know which ones. We start the INA219 at address 45, which we have set with the jumpers in our design before. Define the screen variables for the OLED display. My display is a Midas one that I got on Element 14 and it's pretty weird. I think it has like, its addressing is like, it's kind of, different to the to the usual Adafruit ones. Uh, it works pretty good, but you have to keep in mind that when you rotate it sideways, like I did, it gets a lot more complicated. So if you want to build your own, uh, try to stick um, to have the display in the orientation that it's intended to be, because the addressing of the pixels gets confused when you put it on the side. It's weird. We define a lot of pins and a lot of variables. Nothing special. This is basically a little HTML page in here that is wrapped up into a string and that string gets sent to the server whenever we need to handle 
a root communication, which is somebody access the IP address of this device, of our multimeter. And then it gets served this web page and this basically has placeholders for all the stuff that it measures and we can basically read what we want from it. Of course, we have to begin our I2C setup. This now uses the addresses that we have set prior. So the device now knows which of the pins to use. In case we can't find the chip, we get a serial message. That happened to me. Um, this little board is pretty tricky to assemble. So it could be that you might have to rework some of that design to make it work just to avoid solar bridges and stuff. So I had to do a bit of debugging. This is also set up for the display. And then we draw a little graphic to make it a little bit more interesting or basically so I can see something is happening when it boots up. And of course we have to start our Wi-Fi. And if you use these lines instead of that one, it basically turns it into an access point. So depending on how you want to use it, should it connect to your local network or do you want to connect to it with your cell phone? That's basically up to you. you just have to exchange those variables. And in the loop, which is pretty interesting, we first read the encoder. So on every cycle of the loop, we read if the encoder has changed. If it goes up, we add a number to the counter. If it goes slow, we add, uh, subtract a number to the counter and we have to restrict it to certain values. It's not 022, it's 024 because I have four modes. And in case it goes below or over that value, it resets it to zero. So that also makes it like revolve around when you have surpassed the last mode. So it pretty much feels like the dial of a multimeter. Goal achieved. Next thing is we have to decide which mode we want to put in. So if the counter state is at a certain level, so let's say zero, then we read all the voltages and calculate the load voltage and then that gets displayed on the OLED and we also print it over serial. And if somebody connects with Wi-Fi, we can also get that measurement over Wi-Fi. In the current mode, it's the same thing just with current. And in resistance mode, we have all these calculations that lead pretty much to nothing. That is a work in progress. I couldn't get it to display reliable values. Could be that my series resistor, it's 10K, is a lot too high. Could be that the ADC is crap. Could be that my calculations are pretty much garbage. I, I expect my calculations to be wrong, to be honest. So if you know how to do that, please let me know on the Element Fronting community. Post your code fixes there. I would highly appreciate that if somebody could help me. Math is not my strongest thing. And also we have the last mode, which is Wi-Fi. So then it displays the local IP address on the display. So we know which IP address to connect to. And it also does a little animation with the start scrolling. So we know that the device is active and not stuck. Something that can happen when you make little web server devices is sometimes they get stuck. That happens. And now I have connected my device with USB-C, but to program it, I have to put it in programming mode. So I pull flash low and activate it. It doesn't boot up normally. It's now in programming mode. I select the right uh, settings in my Arduino IDE. So it's ESP32S2. The dev module works also for mine and it's important that we can see it as an ACM device. That's important because ACM, that's a native USB port. And then we hit program. You can see I have uh, the verbose output on so I can see when errors on compiling occur and it's easier to trace them back. And now it's uploading. You can see the addresses it's writing to. And we're at 100%. And oh my God, we have an error. Everything is broken. No, it's not. 
uh, actually I don't have auto reset on this device. That's something you have to implement when you make your own hardware. So if you are using an Arduino, that one has auto reset. This one doesn't. A lot of dev boards have it. I'm actually not a big fan of it uh, because I don't want a device to automatically reset whenever I put power into it. Sometimes I like it to have it connected and I do the reset when I intend to. So I remove the flash, I turn it off and I turn it back on again. And now it should boot. Yep, here's the voltage. If we turn, we get to amperage. Then we get to, oh, it's a little bit twitchy, the encoder. Yeah, then we have milliohms and and this is wi-fi i know 192 that's the first digits of my local network and 101 that is this device and if i look that up on the network i should be able to connect to it i've connected over my browser and it is this is the screen <laughs> from it and as you can see it displays yet. That is my digital MyMX mini multimeter, the DMMMMMMM. And here are the voltages. Bus voltage with 0 0.9 is actually like the residual voltage that it can pick up. Uh, yeah, I should get some EMF protection basically. But the moment you connect it to an external circuit, it basically uh, displays the correct values. Of course, it's not on a product level hardware and software wise, but it should be enough to try it out and see if the design fits and I can work with that. Let's try it out. I'm using the same standard leads that I use on my breadboard to connect my multimeter to the circuit and I can easily probe any connection that I want. Just plug in one of my patch cables into the multimeter and I get a reading, 3.3 volts. That's good. And for current measurement, of course, I have to connect it in series and not in parallel. And this is how much this LED draws. Well, in my opinion, that's a lot easier than connecting a bulky multimeter with a lot of adapters and cables and stuff. So I'm happy that I only have to use what is already provided on my breadboard and I can easily probe any place on my board. And if I put it in Wi-Fi mode, I can also get the readings on my phone. The only bad thing is the ADC on the ESP32S2 is not that good. So I can't get good readings for uh, resistance or yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done on hardware and software to make this into a commercial product. But hey, what do you think? Let me know on the Element 14 community. Could this be something that people would like to buy? A lot of people on the Element 14 community are interested in making their own custom hardware that they may sell someday. So I'm making an episode that covers everything from idea to schematic, board layout, and getting it into production and assembly for a complete project in KiCad like we did on this episode, but totally detailed. If you'd like to see that, join the Element 14 community, subscribe to our channels, and always make sure that you leave your ideas for projects that we can build on the show over on the Element 14 community. And that is also the place where I can answer all your questions with pictures and diagrams and all the fancy stuff that you can't do on any of the other social media things. My tiny multimeter is not as sophisticated as this professional Klein tools, but it's made for a specific purpose to interface with a breadboard. And that's something that it does really good. It has all the basic functionalities I need. And because the code is open, I can add more and more as I learn about them. For example, the Wi-Fi connectivity is already implemented here. If you want to join the development or want to build your own version, head on over to the Element 14 community, download all the codes and files and get your own version going. And Maybe I make an iteration two of this device because there are some things in the hardware that I now know how to fix and a lot of ideas for the code sparked in my mind. But until then, I gotta go. There's another project waiting for me.